This will be the first clip on The Alchemist, and I want to start it by talking a little bit about some Elizabethan and Jacobean theater history. In uh, the late 1590s, James Burbage, the man who funded the first major theater uh, in London, simply called The Theater, where most of Shakespeare's early plays were uh, performed, uh, <clears throat> also acquired a uh, indoor location in a place called Blackfriars. Blackfriars was a Benedictine uh, monastery uh, area located within the city of London. He attempted to get uh, plays performed there in the 1590s, but uh, the London City Council would not let him perform there. They wanted to keep all of the theaters outside of town. So the theater located on the northwest side, the Rose, the Globe, located on the uh, south of London, uh, across the Thames and Southwark, and other t uh, theaters were scattered around the western uh, periphery of London. There were a lot of theaters. Londoners had an insatiable uh, desire to go to plays. So Blackfriars finally gets up and running around 1600 um, through Hooker by Crook. James Burbage uh, acquires the rights to perform there from the city council. And uh, first children's companies perform there. Uh, it's, a, it's a good venue for the Lord Chamberlain's men and the King's men uh, the companies uh, that Shakespeare's plays were performed by, the companies that he was a stakeholder in, uh, because it was enclosed in the winter. And you could be warm there, weather not a problem. This gave the theater companies a chance to ply their trade uh, all year around. So we have a different situation here. We have a theater that uh, seats much, many fewer people, uh, it cost about six times as much to get into one of these private theaters uh, than it would have into the Globe. Uh, so it was lucrative. And uh, <clears throat> people enjoyed going there. Uh, people who had more money. And so a lot of the theater that was performed at these houses was probably a bit more experimental. Um, something that was a bit on the intellectual side which Johnson's plays tend to be. Uh, you'll understand that as soon as you get into the language of this one. I'm going to read a little bit from Elizabeth Cook about the dating of the play, because in, in this case, understanding the date and what's happening at the time is important to understanding the play. Uh, let's see. Some think it unlikely that Johnson would have premiered new work outside London, earlier in 1610, before the company's exile in July. Um, what causes exile? An outbreak of the bubonic plague. So theater companies were shut down. Um, so Cook guesses that this play may have performed first on tour. Okay. Without new evidence, it's impossible to be sure, but since the play's whole fiction revolves around the situation of waiting for the plague to abate and taking advantage of the intervening time, it seems possible that the king's men were doing perforce what many of today's companies choose to do, previewing their work in the provinces before a London run. If that were the case, it would be um, in keeping with a play highly specific about the time and place of its setting, both of which nearly coincide with the circumstances of its early performances. The year is 1610. The 19-year-old widow was born in 1591. Ananias confirms this date. The date of the play's fictional setting is either 23 October or 1 November. So it's very specific about what is taking place. And the people who would have been in this play uh, were well-known people from Shakespeare's company. Richard Burbage, John Hemmings, Henry Condell, uh, Robert Arman, who was a famous fool in Shakespeare's plays. It's fun to speculate on what parts some of these people might have had. So what is The Alchemist about? The Alchemist is a play about transformation. 
the transformation and alchemy of base metals into gold, but more importantly, the transformation of just about anything into money, and especially the transformation of gulls, people who are victimized by con men, into money. Uh, when they are arguing with each other about who deserves the biggest heap of spoils, uh, Face tells Subtle that the people he brings in are the metal that he has to work on. The play is about how London can take anything, transform it into a commodity, and then sell it. Okay, and this is something just a little bit new. Uh, both Dr. Faustus and this play have a lot to say about human desire and how infinite it is, that it can never be satisfied by anything, anything finite. But they deal with it in very different ways. Faustus gives us an almost mythic um, theological statement about the problem. Johnson, very much more down to earth, simply shows us the way that London works and the kinds of expectations that people develop in a consumer society very much like the one that we live in now. How is desire inflamed? Uh, how do people promise to satisfy it? How are people taken in by those promises? In a sense, you could say that The Alchemist is about very effective advertising. Um, it is, in fact, a very perceptive play about London, a city that has been in rapid and constant change since the 16th century. So London itself was something that uh, was undergoing transformation. It was kind of like Los Angeles or New York. I think of Frank Sinatra's song, New York, New York. If I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. Um, London at the time of Ben Johnson and ever since then was a place where the sky is the limit. Uh, and uh, anything, anything could happen. You could go from rags to riches, or if not rags to riches, you could go from being, you know, somewhat prosperous to being immensely wealthy. People, people actually did this. The ultimate philosopher's stone in this play is money, um, which the con men and their victims uh, believe can transform the world into anything they want it to be. So one question I'm just going to throw out right now, and I'll probably answer uh, or address in a later lecture, is what is Johnson saying about money and what it can buy and what it, what it can't buy? He may be saying the, very much the same things that Marlowe is saying, for instance, in Dr. Faustus, Shakespeare is saying like, in a play like The Tempest or Merchant of Venice. Subtle Doll and Face offer the same kinds of things to their victims, uh, their gulls, as success book writers and hucksters offer today. Um, just go to Barnes & Noble and rifle through the uh, self-improvement section uh, that promise major transformations uh, with perhaps not very much effort. Watch How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Uh, turn on certain TV evangelists, and you're going to run into people who are very much like subtle doll and face. Uh, they just wear a more modern costume. One of Johnson's key points in the play is that the economy of London and the assumptions behind that economy uh, believe that money is uh, can buy or sell essentially anything. It can buy or sell sexual pleasure by selling women. In this case, uh, dolls, mad noblewoman, or, or dame pliant who's offered up to a fake Spaniard. Um, it can even offer a product of absolute goodness like the Philosopher's Stone. And once the sale occurs, the commodity's prior history disappears. You reap the rewards uh, of its nature. And this is especially ironic in application to the Philosopher's Stone, for it was held that no man but a good one could create it, and no man but an unselfish one could use it. Uh, this latter, something which Sir Epicure Mammon, one of the most titanic uh, characters in the play, has conveniently forgotten. Another important transformative agent that the alchemist deals with is theater. 
which transforms not only those who see it, uh, but those who act in it. In this case, three con men whose improvisation skills are put to a hilarious extreme of testing by the time the play ends. Um, the Alchemist has one of the most intricate plots in English Renaissance comedy, as the theatrical company and swindling team of Face, Subtle, and Doll Common set up various plays specifically designed to dupe their victims into it in which their victims are assigned roles. So Dahl, Face, and Subtle are very much like a repertory theater company that have many plays going at the same time and are playing many parts in these plays. As the comedy accelerates and these plays threaten to get beyond the control of the con men, uh, as the con men take on more and more uh, than they can really handle they have to go to greater and greater lengths of improvisation to keep the plays, the swindles, from running into each other and crash or crashing down around them in, in chaos. The Alchemist, then, as we will see in the Night of the Burning Pestle, is very much about the theater's ability to um, keep up with the demands of the moment. This is a challenge to any playwright. Uh, it's a challenge to Subtle, Face and Dahl, who rise to the challenge through wit and luck. It's a challenge to Ben Johnson and people writing city comedy to try to por portray London in a way that their audiences would enjoy. Now, this play has almost nothing good to say about London, so we might wonder why they uh, enjoy it. Uh, but I think it's the pluckiness, the energy, uh, the inventiveness of these con men, which Londoners might very well take as, uh, as a kind of definition of what London required. Uh, I think that they would find them to be um, uh, somewhat despicable, but also somewhat lovable at the same time. Uh, it would have been a subtle testimony to the ever-changing scene of London, and its citizens to adapt to the exigencies uh, of the moment. So if you want to look at the play as a series of plays within the play, I would suggest that there are six. One, the play about Dapper. Two, about Abel Drugger. Three, Sir Epicure Mammon. Four, Ananias and Tribulation Wholesome. Five, Surly, disguised as a Spaniard. Uh, six, Kestrel. Uh, Kestrel and his sister, Dame Pliant. Now these last three, Surly, Kestrel, Dame Pliant, are all, are all rather mixed up together. So let's just take a look at how this structure overall might be defined, uh, just to see what the different actors are doing. And uh, for this, there's a handout uh, which you should have printed out. You can look at it. Uh, it's called uh, The Structure of the Alchemist. Um, I'm going to go through that now. Um, so in the dapper play, Subtle plays an astrologer, faces the captain. Captain is slang for pimp. And uh, everybody would know this, including dapper. Um, Don... Dahl, excuse me, is not involved in the swindle, uh, but she later is going to come in on the swindle of Dapper as the Queen of Fairy. Dapper is a young law clerk, a man about town who loves to gamble. He wants a familiar to help him win. In other words, he wants his own little junior Mephistopheles who's going to get out there on the table and make sure those dice get rolled the way he wants them to roll, maybe whisper in his ears about the cards that the other players have got, uh, Dapper is, is a cheat, basically. I mean, he wants a familiar to help him cheat so that he can win every gambling game he's in. And Dapper uh, is a very good person to start with. He's not one of the most ambitious people that we're going to meet in this play uh, who want help from Subtle Face and Doll. But he's kind of a good model because Dapper is crooked. I think all of the people who are trying to use our three con men uh, for their own advantage are all crooked. Um, and this seems to be a necessary part of the con game. 
Uh, and is so today too. I'll tell you a little personal story about this. I had a uh, client once way back when I was a lawyer. Uh, I met him when he was in the King County Jail in Seattle. Uh, his name was Hassan Ali. And uh, I met him uh, in the 1970s uh, when I first started out as a lawyer. He um, had a great swindle. He liked to sell TV sets to people, but the TV sets did not exist. And he would tell them, I have smoke damaged TV sets from Watts, from the Watts riot, for instance. That's at least how he started. And um, I, I can, I've got to get rid of them. I can sell you a TV set at a, dis at a discount. I'll sell you a good TV for $50. And the Mark would say to themselves, Oh, this guy's got a stolen TV set that he wants to unload, so I can get a really good TV set at a uh, really good price. So, of course, receiving stolen goods is a crime in and of itself. Um, uh, Hassan was very good at what he did, and uh, he was able to get money out of people before he ever produced the TV. And, of course, he would just disappear uh, with the 50 bucks or, or whatever it was. And he was able to pull this off for a long, long time. Uh, he was a, a natural-born actor. So his victims were crooks themselves. They were just unsuccessful crooks. Okay, so Dapper is a pretty good example of the kind of guy that uh, my, uh, my former client, Hassan Ali, could have taken advantage of. The second play involves Abel Drugger. Um, in this, we have Subtle again as an astrologer. Face plays the captain, the person bringing in the people for uh, uh, Subtle to work on. Doll again is not in this swindle. We're saving her for bigger, bigger stuff. Abel Drugger is a young member of the Grocers Guild who wants astrological lore so that his drugstore or grocery store or combination uh, of those two things will do well. He sells uh, tobacco. Uh, he wants various things from Subtle. He wants a sign that will bring people in. He wants to know how he should arrange his shelves. He wants to know which way the store should face, which days are good days for him to do business, which days are bad days. Abel uh, believes all these are somewhat governed by the stars, at least, and he wants all the luck that he can possibly uh, get. Abel uh, is not so much a crook as a uh, somebody who's not too bright. Uh, but if he's not too bright and consulting an astrologer about this, then we'd have to say that Queen Elizabeth wasn't too, too bright either because she had court astrologers, as did almost every uh, court in Europe. Um, I don't think that people relied on these astrologers very much, but just in case they wanted, they wanted their input. Okay. So that's Abel Drugger. Then we get play number three, Sir Epicure Mammon, who comes in to see Subtle with his friend Surly. In this play, Subtle changes Costume becomes the alchemist, face changes costume, becomes lungs, the alchemist's assistant. I think he's called lungs because, you know, he works he works a bellows uh, for mammon. Uh, Dahl is introduced rather late into this, uh, just within sight of Sir Epicure Mammon, uh, and she plays a noblewoman who has gone mad from reading the works of a uh, really awful theologian by the name of Hugh Broughton. Uh, from Johnson's perspective, Broughton taught nothing but convoluted nonsense. Uh, if I ever get the chance to direct this play, I'm going to have her reading the works of Jacques Derrida, uh, because I think Derrida can, uh, on that score, go up against anybody. Uh, Epicure Bamon is the first person who wants to get the Philosopher's Stone from subtle and transmute base metals into gold. And then he sees Dahl, and he wants her too. So they've got two ways into Subtle's um, apparently fairly ample pocketbook. Uh, one by uh, peddling Dahl, and uh, two by 
in getting him to finance the quest for the Philosopher's Stone. Surly is a card sharp. He's a Mammon's friend. Uh, he's used to being dishonest himself and looking out for other card players who are dishonest, and he sees through these guys almost immediately. He realizes that Dahl is a prostitute, and uh, he tries and tries to talk Sir Epicure Mammon out of being conned. But Mammon's desires are so great, and his imagination is so caught up in what he might be able to get if he had the Philosopher's Stone that um, nothing certainly can say, uh, that certainly can say, will dissuade Subtle. The fourth play uh, involves Ananias and Tribulation Wholesome. Doll is out of this swindle uh, as she's tied up with both Epicure Mammon and Dapper. Okay. Subtle as the alchemist again faces lungs. Ananias and Tribulation Wholesome are Anabaptists who want to make a pile of money to further their cause. They want to buy politicians. Um, they want to do everything they can to promote Anabaptism. Uh, and Johnson despises them. Johnson despised Puritans altogether, uh, partly because they wanted to shut down the theater, partly because he thought that they were killjoys, and partly because he thought they were astonishing hypocrites. So uh, nobody had a worse, uh, more dedicated enemy uh, who was a Puritan uh, than Ben Johnson. Okay. The fifth play uh, is where we get Surly. Uh, disguised as a Spaniard. This comes in later in the play. And it he fools both Subtle and Face, uh, who decide that uh, they're going to try to set up Surly uh, with a prostitute. That's what, that's what the Spaniard seems to want. Unfortunately, they don't have one available. They, uh, Dahl is, is already overworked. So they have to find somebody, and they grab someone who is completely innocent but stupid enough uh, to be uh, dropped into the part, and this is Dame Pliant, the 19-year-old sister of uh, Castrol. Okay, so uh, she becomes both an object of contention. Uh, they both want her. Subtle wants her. Face wants her. But they're more than willing to let the Spaniard have her, first, if they can make some money off of it. Um, Castrol is into town. He, he wants to consult the astrologer because he wants to learn how to quarrel. Uh, Castrol is rich, it's astonishingly rich. Uh, he has inherited an estate in the country that yields him 3,000 pounds a year. That is an immense fortune in those days. Um, so if they can get a hold of some of his money, all the better. Um, okay, in, in that play, we get Dane Pliant, as I've said, substituted uh, as the Spaniard Surly is undercover. Face plays the captain, and uh, that's pretty much the extent of, uh, of that play. Okay, um, what else? Well, that's a good start. I think we'll, we'll leave it there for now, and then we'll start the next clip.